Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah, I'm a participating pastor, okay? So you guys, feel free to yell, scream, jump, whatever you want to do. Woo! Boo me. I appreciate that. Way up in the corner. I love it. Amen. So, have you guys ever had a really bad nickname? I'm going to assert to you that my nickname is worse than your nickname, okay? Are you ready for this? This is my nickname. Sissy Bridges. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sissy Bridges. Now, this needs an explanation, so I'll tell you about it. I played football when I was in middle school. Love the game of football. Any football fans out there? Any Europeans that like football? There you go. Got some. So, I was a huge football fan. I started playing when I was in middle school, but at the same time, I also got into singing. I, I started singing in public. I joined choir for the first time. And I found out about this thing in high school called show choir. And what show choir is, is basically Broadway, but it's competitive for high school. You do like six songs, and dress changes, and all this stuff. So I go to a concert uh, that my middle school was performing in. It's a pyramid concert. So it's middle school, high school, and the prestige high school, the show choir, comes out and performs. And I saw these guys and these girls came out in these flowing tuxedos, these ball gowns, they just walked out like this, <laughs> smiling. And they, uh, lifted these girls like it was nothing. It was like one hand spinning around. And then at one point, they were tap dancing on fake pianos. They were this tall. And I just remember sitting in that audience, and I saw them, and I just said to myself, I'm pretty sure out loud, I said, I'm going to do that. Like, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I did. I auditioned. I got in in high school. I also kept playing football. And this is where Sissy Britches came in. So what happened was, I was in my PE health class, and I was... Uh, Answering a question on emotion, our, uh, our PE teacher, my varsity football coach, was talking about emotion, and he said, have any of you been dumped? So eager to impress my varsity coach and to show my sensitive side to some of the ladies that were there, I said that I've been dumped before. They asked me what happened. I said, well, the first girl that I ever asked to be my girlfriend responded like this. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that was kind of crushing, right? So I go home, kind of down, my mom asks me what's going on, I tell her what happens, and instead of going through my normal routine, she actually cooked me dinner early. <laughs> it was like some of my favorite food, and I just watched TV with her. And I don't remember what was on TV, but it was just it was really nice, it was like really comfortable. So I say that to my uh, varsity football coach, and he goes, are you kidding me? And he goes, man, sister britches, I bet you probably stayed by yourself, without your mama, ate fried chicken and watched Oprah. Everyone busts out laughing. And I'm sitting there going, ha, 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 ha. After a while, I didn't really feel bad, mainly because some of the girls came up to me after and was like, oh, like, you're so sensitive. I was like, nailed it. I'm so pumped. But I tell you that story because though Sissy Bridges was a, a fun nickname, I actually had that nickname all throughout high school. Um, when I look back, it's such a staple for me in high school. Like, I had no identity. I was trying to figure out where I fit in, right? I loved football, but I loved singing, and you couldn't do both of those in high school. You had to do one or the other. Now, have you ever felt like you haven't fit in? Have you ever seen just clicks? And not only in high school, not only at businesses, but we love Jesus. Have we seen this in our church? I mean, there's a lot of diversity. Look at us. Look at how many denominations we have represented today. Are we clicky? Are there diversities? How do we deal with that? Well, Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, addresses this issue. He addresses diversity of the church and how we can live in our diversity. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12. If you want to go ahead and turn there, you can. We're going to be looking specifically at verses 12 through 27. And what Paul is going to say for us today is that you, as a human being, are unique and original. You are also interdependent on every other Christian. Because we are a part of the one body of Christ possessed by the one Holy Spirit of oh God. All right, so let's start reading this message. Once again, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27. We are going to read from 12 to 14, 
And we're going to stop there. Verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Okay, so a little bit of background around, um, about uh, Corinth. Corinth uh, had a couple of issues, two main issues. The first one was there was a hierarchy. See, in Rome, your social status really determined where you went. And there were Christians in this church that believed that since they had a higher social status, since they had a higher job, or they just were citizens of Rome, that they had advantage over slaves, over someone that wasn't a citizen, over someone that might have had a lower paying job or maybe was disrespected in the community. One of the other things that was going on in Corinth at that time, excuse me, was that they had an emphasis on only a few of the spiritual gifts of God. And they believed that those were really important, while others maybe weren't that important. So Paul, in these first couple of verses, is saying that a body is one, but it has many, many members. And this is how we see Christ, because there's one spirit that we all are baptized into, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. So what he's doing is he's using our body. Now, think about your body for a second. I just Googled how many bones does your body have, and I found out that our body has in between 206 to 270 bones, depending on how old you get, some of the bones infuse. Some scientists try to do the math about how many cells you have. And we have around 50 trillion cells in our body. That's a lot of diversity. That's a lot of different parts working together. But here's the crazy thing. You wouldn't look at this and go, well, my arm is just completely separate of my body. This is connect by one by one exoskeleton, one set of skin. And Paul is looking at the Corinthians and saying, though we are all members, we are connected by one body. Now, a question that arises when I think about that is, okay, so, yeah, we have one body, but um, wouldn't you ask that if you're right-handed, that this arm might be a little better than this arm? I can't do, I can't write with this hand, because I'm right-handed. Or... Would you say that maybe your eyes are a little better than your ears? Like, there has to be some type of hierarchy between the body parts that we possess. Let's see what Paul says. We're back in 1 Corinthians 12. We're on verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Well, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? So using this illustration, Paul is basically saying... Hands were made to be hands, and feet were made to be feet. Eyes were meant to be eyes, and ears were meant to be ears. If you were just an eye, that would freak me out. Because all it is is just a bunch of eyes sitting right there. That doesn't make any sense. He's telling the Corinthians that you are a unique and original creation. You were created by God to fulfill a specific purpose. And just because you're not an eye doesn't mean that you're not important. Just because you're not an ear, you're not a foot, doesn't mean that you're not important. Now, I need to take a break from this passage and say one thing that I think you can pull out of this message. It's not explicitly written in here, but that is because of the context in which Paul is writing to the Corinthians. I'm going to talk about original sin. Because I think in our culture... It is very easy for us to find differences that we have that maybe no one else has and try to validate those differences as, oh, well, God gave me this. But here's the point. Paul is not talking about sin. Paul is talking about characteristics and a personality and gifts that are given to you by God. 
Because see, here's the crazy thing about all of us being unique. No one has ever been created like you. Do you know what that also means? No one can sin like you can. Nobody. Do you know what that also means? No one has been given the grace that you've been given. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for you. And you, and you, and you. And each and every one of us, he died personally to erase us of the sin that we had. So don't let that theology creep up into this text. We are talking about the gifts that God has given us. That we are all unique and we are all created for a purpose. And we've talked about that, but still, what does that mean in regards to a hierarchy? In regards to, you know, say you have all the money and you don't really need someone else. Because that was the other issue that was being dealt with in Corinth. Here's how Paul finishes. Verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all of the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually. See, I'm right-handed. That means that my left hand is stronger. Because if I got groceries, they're all going on this hand. Also, because I'm lazy and I don't want to make multiple trips. I'm a one-trip kind of guy that goes from the car in the house. All right. So this hand has all of my groceries so I can use this hand to work. Now, would that mean that this hand is weaker? No. It means that this hand is different. Even though technically this arm is stronger than this arm, this arm has a different purpose. And this arm can't look at this arm and say, I don't need you. Now, let me give you an example in the church. Actually, I'm sorry. I need to cut to something else. Um, I brought this book up. This is a book called Conflict and Community in, in Corinth by Ben Witherington III. This guy is a lot smarter than I am. And this book has actually really helped me out. And he makes a mention into this verse that I just need to hit. It's um, about the presentable parts and the unpresentable parts. Okay? What Paul is talking about, he's actually talking about private parts. He's talking about that our presentable parts, like my arms and my face, there's no really modesty there. You know? They're typically shown. But I covered a couple of things, right? Just a couple of things that are covered. And we understand that. We're not going to walk around uncovered. We know that contextually in the Near East during that time, that's shameful. And now that's still shameful. But why is that? Paul would say that is because our unpresentable parts are reproductive parts. They cause reproduction. Now let me give you an example by the church. Everyone is going to talk about the pastor when they come to the church. They're going to talk about what the building looks like. They'll talk about the worship leader. But do you know why people will stay at churches? Because of the greeters. Because of the Sunday school teachers. Because of the ones that were leading their Bible study. Because of the ones that were going to their Bible study. Because of their co-workers. It is these people that are not presented in the church that are of the utmost importance. Why? Because they cause re they reproduce Christians. There is all, there is equality in the church of God, in the body of Christ, because all parts are coming together serving the purpose. I want to end with one more illustration. I brought this flag 
slash this drawing. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this real quick. This, this drawing is actually the first political cartoon that was uh, ever made in the United States of America. Fun fact. The purpose of this was to cause unity during all the colonies during the Revolutionary War. Because see, the Revolutionary War wasn't originally called the Revolutionary War. It was called the War of New England. Because these crazy fools up in Boston, in Philadelphia, and New York, they were going to war against Britain. And all the other colonies, well, they didn't want to be un, you know, not represented in, in Parliament, but they were still wanted to remain loyal to Britain. But the Continental Congress knew that if they were going to win this war, they couldn't win it with just this one part. They needed all of the colonies, so they made this flag. Now, I have a question for you. Is this snake alive? No! This snake is dead! Look, 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 his tongue sticking out. It's like cut up into all different pieces. It's probably a gruesome thing. You might ask what these symbols stand for. New England, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, North Carolina. These are different colonies that chose to separate themselves from each other. Now listen, I don't have a lot of validity in certain areas, but I do think I can speak to you as someone who has spent years being educated by one of the greatest fighting forces on this earth. I have been trained and taught to kill an enemy and to kill them effectively. And I will tell you today that the strategy has never changed. If you want to defeat an enemy, you don't defeat it in one swoop. You cut it up into tiny pieces. If you cut communication, they can't talk. If you destroy their supply lines, they can't eat. They can't resupply themselves. You start cutting off little pieces, and that beast will die. And that, my friends, is how America defeated the greatest military empire on the face of the earth at that time. In church, we have an enemy. His name is Satan. He knows this strategy. I'm a jock. I'm a nerd. She's a goody two shoes. He has sex with his girlfriend. Homosexual marriage. Abortion. Women in ministry. Infant baptism. Things that separate. Things that cause our death. Now let me tell you something else. This is a lie. That is the lie that Satan wants you to believe. That we are not united. The whole purpose of this passage is that God is the one who brought us together. It is God that made you unique. It is God that planted your church wherever it is. And do you think that he's not going to complete it? Do you think that he's not going to stand there and say, we'll, 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 I really hope you guys do a good job. I set you up. Don't fail. No. That's not the God that we believe in. Today, I want you to look at your strengths. And I want you to look at your weaknesses. And I want you to look at your brothers and sisters in your church. Look at their strength. Look at their weakness. I firmly believe that God has given you all the tools you need to succeed in that church. And it's not because you're there. It's because God's there. It's not because your church is perfect. It's because God's church is perfect. He has made his kingdom of, his kingdom of heaven come to earth. And the gates of hell will not question that we have to ask ourselves. I can't help think of the Gospels when Jesus is praying for his disciples in John and he says, I ask that they would be one as you and I are one. And then further in the Gospels he says, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Do we know is that? All we know is this. It's sober. But it's also joyful. Because even if we're known as this, we know we're not this. You are unique. You are special. And you are interdependent on your church. We are all 
all bound together under one head.